Over the years, cyclists have come up with all sorts of crazy ideas in the pursuit of performance enhancement and variety of training. And some of those ideas were a bit crazier than others. Yeah, coming up are our all-time favourites, no matter how considered the process were to get them. Before we get into the video, though, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel and click on the notification icon because... Well, then you'll get a notification every time we upload a video. First up, a training method that was used by Alejandro Valverde's training partner, and it involves the humble parachute. Now this creates 10 kilograms of drag, but we're not exactly sure what speed this is quoted at. And to be honest, it does the job. It creates resistance. But now with the dawn of power meters, we can sit at those numbers, meaning we get better structured workouts. I mean, it could be good for riding with slower riders, but if you ask me, it looks pretty sketchy. And I'm glad Chris is doing it, because I definitely wouldn't do it. Now this is one of my favorites. Stick it in the 5317, and don't count out of it. Spend all right in that gear. Now the thought process behind this was that by overgearing on the climbs, you'd be increasing the muscular strength in your legs because you were having to push harder to get up them. And then on the descents, because you were effectively undergeared, you'd be increasing the ability to spin and therefore your top speed. However, we now know that unless you're doing torque efforts in an incredibly structured manner, you're probably not getting the benefits you thought you were. So do you reckon I could change gear now? Well, considering it probably didn't work in the way they thought it should, yeah. Now this is a quick and easy way to make your workouts even harder. I'm talking about weighing down your bike. Now you can do this by going for some heavier wheels, heavier tires, or go the whole hog and replace your water bead on with a lead version of one of these. Pop that in and there you have it, a fully laden version of your bike, meaning those sessions are gonna be difficult. Now, James, to demonstrate this next one effectively, you are going to have to empty your bottle, I'm afraid. Empty my bottle? In fact, just, you know, give it to me. Seriously? Yeah. You don't need any water because back in the day, it was thought that training with no water in your bottles or no bottle on your bike at all was the key to performance enhancement. The idea being that when you came to race day and you did indeed have a drink, all of a sudden your body would magically perform at a higher level than you had been. The only flaw was that you'd probably been training in such a dehydrated state, you were unable to hit your training targets, meaning that you were effectively under training yourself, therefore weren't ever gonna make the fitness gains you've been aiming to make. Yeah, I'm not convinced. No. Next one. How are you gonna fill that out though? You're not having mine. Ah. Now this one I have definitely heard of over the years. Eating is cheating. Or as the Dutch might say, you ate yourself of cantaloupes, you're eating away your chances. Yeah, the idea behind this is that you train under fueled. And when it came to race day, you'd be fully fueled up and perform at your best. Now, of course, eating is definitely not cheating. And I don't care how many studies are done on low carb or fasting. If you want to get faster and stronger on your bike, you do at some point need to fuel your muscles properly. It doesn't matter what studies are done on low carb or fasting because you still cannot ignore the insurmountable data that comes from carbohydrates and performance. It's yeah. just a fact. Yeah, so don't be afraid to eat that gel or bar on that long ride. When I was growing up, I would read stories of pro riders who'd been out most pacing behind their team cars, boot lid open and all the riders tucked in underneath. And they were going fast, and I mean seriously fast. Speeds well in excess of 80 k's an hour were done with relative ease and cadences of 130 to 160 RPM. The theory behind this was that if you could manage these speeds and those high cadences, when it came to racing at a slower speed, you'd be much more comfortable and finding it easier. So was it sound advice? Well, yes and no. Motor pacing behind a scooter is a genuinely great way to train. It replicates racing and that chasing feeling that you have in a way that you can't otherwise. You have to recover over rises and out of corners without ever fully backing off the pedals. But you do need a good pacer. So was the boot lid behind the car overkill? Maybe just a little. 
Now for a bit of resistance training. Now this one I've actually used on that 10,000 calorie challenge. But now, Chris, it's your turn and it involves, well, pulling on your brakes. Right, I'm not sure we need to elaborate on this one too much, but does it work? Well, possibly, yes, because a company called Airhub have actually designed something which does exactly this. It doesn't apply your brakes. Instead, it swaps your front wheel for one of theirs, which applies the brakes to the hub and increases the resistance. And it makes good sense, because imagine you live somewhere flat and you're nowhere near the climbs, yet there's an event that you want to ride and it's mountainous. You don't want to be doing these big, long efforts screaming along in the 53.11, those 60 k's an hour. It's more beneficial to do something with a higher torque demand, more similar to the speeds you'll be doing in the event. So it makes good sense. And it also means that if you want to ride with someone slower than you, they can keep up. There, there's a reason why I made you put your brakes on, mate. You're a little bit fitter than I am right now. So keep on them brakes. High altitude simulation mask, anyone? It's not a great look, I'll agree, but it is a way of simulating high altitude training without actually going there. Although the science behind high altitude training is that you should sleep high and train low. This is so you get the adaptations from altitude acclimation overnight, but still maintain a high level of workload by training down at sea level, where you're able to produce higher power numbers. So this is essentially the reverse version, train high, sleep low. Would you benefit from using it? No, research shows not. Decreased alertness and focus, along with the fact that you simply won't be able to push hard enough to create the adaptations needed to improve your performance, mean that this really isn't worth the hassle or the weird looks. So there you have it, some bizarre, slightly unusual training sessions that you might be better off avoiding. Yeah, if you enjoy this video, then make sure you give it a big thumbs up. And if you've got any old training ideas that you think you'd like to share with us, drop it in the comments below. And for more how-to videos, click down here. Now I reckon it's time we get a nice warm cup of tea. Sounds good to me. <laughs>